Hearings are on at the International Court of Justice on the question of the Israeli occupation of Palestine. The ICJ, or the World Court as it is known, is hearing the matter on a request from the UN General Assembly and the hearings are on the legal consequences of Israel's occupation since 1967. Now, a number of countries have already presented their viewpoints and many more are set to do so, with the hearings set to go on till February 26th. We go to Abdul to find out what are some of the submissions that have been made in the court. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. There have been a lot of reports over the past uh, four days. Today is the fifth day of the hearings. More countries expected to uh, give their submissions. So maybe first take us through what has been the general sense of the kind of submissions countries have made, what have been the larger arguments they have been presenting. And in fact, if you could also actually start with what is the question the court is hearing in the first place? Well, uh, Prashant, as far as the question in front of the court is concerned, it is related to the UN uh, General Assembly resolution, which was adopted in December 2022, uh, uh, in which basically General Assembly asked for an uh, advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice about what is the legal status when it comes to the occupation, Israeli occupation of Palestine. Apart from that, this is a general question under which there are specific questions related to what is the status of the settlements which are built by Israel in violation of international law in the occupied territory? How do we see the Israeli policies when it comes to kind of uh, treating uh, occupied people, Palestinians and the illegal settlers within the same occupied territories, uh, whether it uh, qualifies to be called apartheid uh, or not? Then there are other questions related to the overall violations of the Palestinian human right within the occupied territories, the violence they are subjected to. So it is basically a set of questions which basically are related to Israeli policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis the occupied Palestinians and uh, the overall status, legal status of uh, 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 Israeli uh, occupation. So uh, basically on that subject, of course. Uh, there are around 50 uh, uh, odd countries which are basically set to submit their positions in front of the court. There are three main organizations, including the Arab League, which basically will present its case in front of the court. And, and uh, so far, uh, if you see, there are two different set of uh, uh, opinions uh, or the positions which have been uh, submitted in front of the court, uh, uh, which basically, uh, of course, there are a set of countries like United States, which have been basically supportive of Israel, which has been known to be supportive of Israel's policies inside Palestine in, and, and because there has been a general opinion that U.S. has been the reason behind the prolongation of the occupation uh, in Palestine, uh, uh, as well as there are countries which basically have historically opposed to occupation and demanded a two-state solution as soon as possible. So these have been the general uh, uh, set of positions which we have uh, seen in last five days so far. Uh, so U.S. has defended, Chinese have opposed, um, and there are, of course, Palestinians who have demanded a separate state as soon as possible. Abdullah, what has been Israel's uh, response to uh, these proceedings? Well, uh, uh, Israel's position has basically, Israel is one of those countries who have chosen not to present its case orally in front of the court and in fact have uh, submitted a written uh, uh, what you call position uh, uh, despite the fact that it says that this uh, entire set of questions are illegitimate and court should not opine on it uh, it basically also has said that this it, it will not uh, consider uh, ever, uh, the legal opinion given by the ICJ legitimate Hence, it means that whatever will be the opinion of the court, it will not implement it, it will not consider it legitimate. If you see, uh, uh, as I was referring to earlier about two contrasting positions which have been taken, the US, in fact, came out openly saying that uh, ICJ should not give an opinion to kind of asking Israel to withdraw from its uh, uh, withdraw its uh, occupation and hence in a way justifying the occupation and kind of demanding for its prolongation. Uh, Chinese, on the other hand, for example, have said that the occupation is illegal and, and since this is an occupation, it's a colonialism, uh, Palestinians have right to self-defense, uh, Palestinians have right to resist 
and therefore it their assistance should not be compared uh, with terrorism as we have seen us has often called uh, hamas for example the actions taken by hamas as terrorism or israel have uh, israel has claimed that uh, all palestinian assistance is basically a form of terrorism uh, chinese uh, agreeing with most of the african countries for example south africa also has already submitted saying that all these claims that palestinians uh, uh, fighting for their independence is uh, terrorism is basically a, a, a logic which basically justified colonialism and occupation and that should not be considered so israel's position that even these kind of arguments should not be entertained by the court is basically a position which uh, falls into the in the larger uh, understanding about israel which most of the uh, uh, anti colonial movements have that this is a colon colonial uh, uh, outpost in west asia and basically it wants to be there of course serving certain imperialist forces uh, at the global level and and that's what has come out in what us was has submitted despite the fact that in the international fora it, it has also talked about two state solution and so and so forth so real intentions it seems have come out in during the hearing in the icj abdul thank you so much for the update but do stay back we'll come to you for the next story as the ukraine war completed two years the european union countries have agreed on a 13th round of sanctions against russia the sanctions will be formally approved on saturday russia has been heavily sanctioned by the eu countries the us and its other allies since february 2022 although these measures have really failed to significantly affect russia's economy what are these new sanctions and how have earlier rounds affected russia we go back to abdul Right, Abdul. Welcome back. Round thirteen of EU sanctions against Russia. The war has crossed two years, and of course, there are also sanctions by the U.S., Canada, Japan, all these countries. So, uh, let's first go to these specific sanctions. Uh, you know, what do they comprise of at this point? What is left to sanction right now? Well, uh, in the last two years, there is hardly anything left uh, when it comes to Russia to sanction by the Europeans and by the U.S. Uh, so now they are basically uh, listing. individual entities uh, mostly um, some individuals and some of the what they claim to be arm producing groups not only uh, in uh, uh, russia but also uh, in other countries for example china hong kong and so on and so forth uh, claiming that these entities have some links with russians they help them produce weapons and hence uh, there should be sanctions against them so use use thunder out 13 round of sanctions are primarily related to the sanctioning around 200 uh, odd individuals and entities which basically allegedly deal with the weapon manufacturing in russia right so uh, how have these sanctions fared over the past years not just the eu sanctions but also us sanctions i guess the original intent when it was imposed was there was an expectation that there would be a drastic collapse a uh, followed by mass discontent in russia which would probably overthrow the putin regime probably that was a calculation but what has been the result of all these sanctions well uh, it is quite obvious if you see that uh, the way russian economy is performing the way we do not find any uh, large scale opposition to russia's uh, uh, war what as it is called in ukraine uh, inside the country we we do do not see isolation of russia at the global level as well in fact russia has expanded uh, the group of uh, uh, country uh, expanded the number of countries with which it has it has uh, you can say better diplomatic relations than ever since 1990s uh, for example Uh, its participation in brics basically has led to an expansion of that grouping then uh, the shanghai cooperation organization another grouping where it is has been expanded in the last 2 years and if you see um, uh, as as i said before the russian economy is in fact as per the imf um, uh, estimates is in fact instead of contracting it it has basically expanded in last 2 years uh, given uh, the uh, the amount of oil it is able to sell across the world uh, amount uh, the uh, the gas it is able to sell across the world its exports also have diversified and it is uh, its local manufacturing in fact has grown uh, ever since uh, the uh, um, sanctions have been imposed so uh, unlike the intentions it seems that the sanctions have helped russia 
kind of consolidates its economy and emerge as much more positive player in the global uh, politics than ever before on the other hand if you see because of the sanctions european economies have suffered uh, uh, one of their worst uh, economic crisis uh, since 1990s at least uh, there are protests going on inside europe european countries by the farmers by other uh, uh, working class uh, sections which have claimed that because of the sanction policies one of the reasons of course apart from the other things their their eco- income has suffered and 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 uh, in fact they have opposed uh sanctions against russians and their country's position to kind of fund the ukrainian war taxing the working classes and the farmers in their own countries so it seems whatever was the intention it has basically uh, played as a kind of boon for the uh, uh, for the russians uh, at least the sanctions imposed by both the Euro- us and the european union right so abdul so two years into the war what does the strategy of uh, the western countries at this point seem because uh, both from a military and a financial perspective because we don't see any major breakthroughs happening on the battlefront in fact uh, ukraine lost avdivka uh, recently as well so uh, what seems to be the plan for these countries in the coming months well it's difficult to uh, find out and or uh, point out a, a, a concrete strategy with which the europeans or the us uh, are working in the israel uh, sorry in the russia ukraine conflict or the war um if you see uh, they have continued since the first day of the war to kind of uh, pursue a kind of policy which basically uh, uh, to demonize russia completely uh, delegitimate uh, its claims about its security about the uh, expansion of nato about the problems with the russian speaking population was facing inside ukraine so they have completely rejected all these russian claims and try to portray it as a demon uh, which basically is uh, expansionist wants to expand and so and so forth which uh, of course uh, seems unrealistic and now that after 2 years this particular propaganda it seems have run its course and there is there is uh, the the amount of popular support it had in the initial days at least in europe and us has also gone down tremendously because uh, it, it, it the emptiness uh, behind this slogan has uh, been exposed uh, despite that europeans and the us continue to um, pitch the same line and continue to kind of demand more money from their taxpayers to kind of to send to uh, 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 ukraine if you see there is already a bill pending in the us for billions of dollars of aid for ukraine U- european union has recently approved 54 billion dollar uh, aid for ukrainians uh, for ukraine all of this money of course is coming from the taxpayers in both european union and us and despite the fact that they are having economic issues so they continue to pitch uh, a, a kind of uh, anti russia uh slogans uh, uh, and continue to fund the war in ukraine without uh, kind of hoping at least they have also admitted that there is no uh, uh, movement on the battleground at least uh, after the failure of the counter offensive at least uh, uh, uh ukrainian counter offensive so called counter offensive that there is no gain on the on, uh, on uh, at the b- battleground and the uh, wise course would have been to kind of look for a political solution but that is not happening there is no attempt to explore that option and they continue to pitch the same line which they have been doing for last two years right. abdul thank you so much for that analysis on both these topics we'll come back to you in, in future episodes as well that's all we have in today's daily debrief we'll be back back with a fresh episode tomorrow in the meantime do visit our website peoplesdispatch.org follow us on all the social media platforms and if you're watching this on youtube please hit the subscribe button Thank you.